Thank you for gathering with us. It really wasn't that bad a year when you look back at all that God accomplished. And that's perspective, <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. And Steve, thank you for that perspective as well from God's Word. It always helps transform our spirits when we're connected to the Spirit of God, and I appreciate that. We're starting a brand new study today, going through the book of Daniel. Now, very often when we think of the book of Daniel, or at least when I think of the book of Daniel, if you were to say, what can you recall from your Sunday school days or vacation Bible school days about Daniel? What did Daniel do? Usually there are two stories that come to my mind. Daniel in the lion's den, and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in a fiery furnace. Those are the things that usually stick out, and they're in there. So we're going to cover that material. But today we're going to give you a nice broad overview, and we're going to talk not only about what we are going to accomplish getting through this book, but perhaps even more importantly, I'm going to be sharing what we are not going to try to accomplish in this prophetic book today. To kick things off and get us thinking about what it can be like when we're trying to obey God, we're trying to live according to his principles, according to his character, and yet when we come up against something that's so massive and so powerful, kind of like what uh, Steve was teaching us just this morning a little earlier in our growth encounter about David with his slingshot coming up against a giant. Well, Karen Chapel had an experience like that when her husband was in seminary. He was studying a master's and eventually a doctorate <clears throat> and she was working in a really good paying job as a quality control expert in a uh, medical facility manufacturing plant. They were making things like syringes, one of the many items that they manufactured there. And one day, somebody on the line failed to follow certain procedures and the automatic equipment could crank out a lot of syringes in a single day. And in just a couple of hours time, several thousand syringes were manufactured and apparently they weren't done correctly. And Karen knew this because she had given tests to that. And so she thought, okay, I can't let these syringes go out. They didn't look bad, but they were contaminated. And according to their procedures, she was supposed to inform her boss, which she did. And the boss quickly got out a calculator and started calculating the cost of throwing away all those syringes. <clears throat> and he scratched his head for a moment and he tapped his fingers on the desk and he looked right at Karen and he said, we're gonna make a cost effective decision. This is business. I want you to sign off on these syringes. And Karen couldn't do it. She said, my conscience wouldn't let me do it. I knew that God would not be pleased with that. This is a terribly unethical decision. I can't do it. And I informed him of that. I said, I'm sorry, but I, I can't do that. He said, well, you really need to do that. And you need to do that right away. And she goes, I just, I can't do that. So he said, I'm going to call the president. She goes, okay, go ahead. Called the president of the company. He came in. They talked about it as well. He threatened her. And then he said, I know. I'm sorry. I, I've come on too hot. Let me back up a little bit. Let me give you the weekend to think about it. It was Friday. He said, Take Saturday and Sunday, think about it. And if you still can't sign off on these by Monday, that'll be your job. So just think about that. And she went home. So she and her husband prayed about it. She thought about it. She couldn't do it. She came back and informed them on Monday that I can't do that. It's, it's unethical. Well, according to federal guidelines, only Karen could sign off from that quality control. Nobody else could do that because that's why they have quality control. And so the syringes did not make it in time to a certain company that they were going to be selling them to. We're gonna just leave that story right there and ask you the question, what would you do if you were in Karen's spot? That's kind of what gets us thinking about some of the situations that we find in Daniel. There were some people who found themselves in what seemed like impossible situations and they wanted to stand up for God they wanted to stand for Yahweh and do the right things, even though it looked like they were in great jeopardy. Let's pick it up there and start looking at the book of Daniel. Here's the big picture, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to see the forest today. 
then we're going to start looking at the trees and get through all of these different things that I'm just painting a picture for you today. I'm going to be reading an awful lot off the screen, so I hope I, hope I don't give you PowerPoint fatigue. <laughs> so if you start to nod off and you're sitting next to somebody, if you see them nod off, you, you have my permission to elbow them. But I want you to lean just a little bit closer and look in and recognize that this is important information and you need to get this overview so you can get the very most out of this study. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, good for you. Here's the setting. It's right after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem. They plundered the temple and a first wave of Israelites were taken into exile at 607 BC. I will remind you of something that Mark Elwell had been teaching us about when we were going through some things in the book of Judges and in some of our Old Testament studies. All the way back last year when we did the winter Bible study, we had some of these dates in mind. And we understand from that, I hope you'll recall some of that, that there were actually three waves of people being carried into captivity in the Babylonian captivity. The first was the invasion and captivity around 607 BC at which time Daniel and his friends, along with some others, were carried up into Babylon. We read about that in 2 Kings, in Jeremiah, and in Daniel. So there's corroborative evidence there. Second invasion and captivity took place in 597, so 10 years later, at which time King Jehoiakim and 10,000 of the people were carried into captivity. You might recognize a couple of the names of the people who are part of this wave. They included Ezekiel, another prophet and a contemporary of Daniel, and one of the ancestors of Mordecai, his cousin, Esther. Aha. And then 10 years later, so over the span of 20 full years, these three waves took place. There's this third invasion and more people taken up into captivity. 587 BC, Jerusalem was conquered. Its walls and palaces, as well as the temple, were destroyed. Joy and I saw some of the stones that were actually cast down off the walls and from the temple when we were in Jerusalem. They were huge. That was a real job for them to try to destroy the temple. And the inhabitants were carried away into exile. This marked the end of the southern kingdom. So this was a big deal for Jerusalem and Israel itself. Now, this uh, first wave of captivity included four guys from the royal family, it said. What's the royal family? Well, that's the line of David. We see that thread all the way through the Old Testament pointing ahead in time to the Messiah. So we have Daniel, that's of course the person we're reading about, who was renamed by Nebuchadnezzar in his administration in Babylon as Belteshazzar. And he named all these guys the Babylonian names because he was trying to erase their culture. And he wanted the young, bright men, people who were from the, the royal line, because he was trying to convert them to becoming more like Babylonians, in a sense. He wanted to grab the best and the brightest and use them for his purposes. There was Hananiah, a.k.a. Shadrach, Mishael, a.k.a. Meshach, and Azariah, also known as Abednego. Now, these guys, probably you could have written a theme about their life and some of the things that they experienced, and that theme could be called Maintaining Hope in the Land of Their Conquerors or in the Land of Their Oppressors. And that was certainly a part of the theme that runs all the way through the book of Daniel. If you want a really good and pictorial very artistic overview. I posted it for you on our closed group Facebook page, but you can also find it for yourself on YouTube. All you have to type in really is Bible Project Daniel. I tried it. All you need is those three words, Bible Project Daniel, and this thing will pop up called the overview, and it's got some really artistic way of looking at it, and it shows the beauty and the artistic approach to how Daniel's book was designed in the first place. It's like it was written on either side of a demarcation in the middle of the book, and there are parallels and things that pair up with one another. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's pretty remarkable when you start to see it this way. It's about an eight minute plus video, and it's worth the look. So I urge you to go and look at that. I'm lifting much of the copy from that right out of, uh, of that particular presentation, and I give them credit for it. 
in this Bible project because it's so concise and so well written that I'm giving it to you today, but you need to see the pictures. And I didn't want to put all those on here uh, today. And we, there's some copyright issues there too. So I didn't want to just play it for you today. So who wrote Daniel? <laughs> well, duh, it's Daniel. How do we know that? Well, you could say he claims his own authorship, but if some people are skeptical and they go, oh, well, anybody could claim authorship. then my sister would say, well, if you don't believe me, just ask me. <laughs> well, we're not content to do that. Fortunately, that contemporary Ezekiel, another prophet, also recognizes Daniel, and we can read that in Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 14 and 20. And Daniel documents the dates, not only of when he starts all these prophetic writings, but also the different visions and when they took place. And so there's there some historic corroboration for when it took place. And then, if that's not enough, <laughs> Jesus actually quotes Daniel and treats that book as though it's valuable and valid. So Jesus quotes Daniel. Jesus thinks that Daniel is the actual author of Daniel. He doesn't dispute that. We can read that in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. So Daniel wrote Daniel, just to get that out of the way. The first section is written in Hebrew. We can see that there's Aramaic, there's Hebrew, and it kind of goes back and forth. It's interesting how they do that as well, and I'm sure we'll be looking into some of the reasons for that in detail, but you should just know that that helped people pair things up, and it helps give a timeline as well as to why he would have written when and why he would have written in another language at a different time. The exiled Israelites remain faithful to the Torah. God rewards them. That's a real summary statement for this first section. Uh, we'll get into the details, but as you'll know, uh, the Babylonians wanted Daniel and his friends to eat the food that they were going to be serving them, and it was very rich food. And they said, yes, but we have certain dietary restrictions because we want to serve God, and God knows what's best for us, and he's given us these dietary restrictions for our own good. And so there's a bit of a challenge related to that. But they remained faithful to the Bible, or to what they would have known as the Bible, the first five books of the Old Testament, and then God rewards them for that. Second section. Uh, repeat that with me to wake you up. Say second section. Second section. Good for you. Only Daniel can interpret the king's dream about a huge statue, and it symbolizes a series of kingdoms following Babylon. And these kingdoms will fill the world with violence. And so fortunately, Daniel is gifted by God with this divine knowledge, the ability to discern what this dream meant. God's kingdom will come. This is another part of this discernment, this uh, interpretation. God's kingdom is going to come. And at that time, he's gonna humble the arrogant kingdoms of the world. And God will fill the world with his healing justice. That's a broad overview of the dream interpretation from King Nebuchadnezzar. Third section, everybody say third section. Daniel and his friends remain loyal to God, and God delivers them, this time from the fiery furnace. It was the one that was heated seven times hotter. Those are the bellows, for those of you who are wondering. These Israelites are exalted by the king who acknowledges that their God is the true God. And this is something we find as a continuing theme as well, that you've got a human leader, but the human leader recognizes some divine power going on. And then there's a transference of uh, attitude, a conversion, if you will. And this happens with the furnace. It says, okay, everybody should worship this God because their God's really got it together. Then we've got the fourth and fifth sections and they kind of come coalesced, they come together. They're important to be seen together because it's stories of two Babylonian kings the first king, which is Nebuchadnezzar, the one that we see at the beginning of Daniel's experience there in Babylon, and that's the father. And then Nebuchadnezzar has a son, and that's Belshazzar, and that's in the fifth section. So the fourth and fifth sections parallel father and son. Both kings are power hungry, and they are so prideful, and so they set themselves up over God. And God warns them, both through dreams and visions, which only Daniel can in interpret. So once again, we have dreams and visions. Daniel is given this supernatural ability and God uses that because he's going to be giving a message, not just to these kings, 
but the message also that's carried all the way through into future generations, including us. So fortunately, God did all of this for our benefit just as much as he did it for Daniel and his friends. Daniel tells both of these kings that they are supposed to humble themselves before God. Do they? No. They resist. They get stiff-necked about it. They rebel. They keep doing the things they're going to be doing. They exalt themselves instead of exalting God. And then in this fourth section, Nebuchadnezzar becomes like a beast, and he's crawling around on the ground, and he's eating grass. But later, he actually does come to his senses. It was almost like he went through a period of temporary insanity, and he was like a beast. But his senses are restored, and he is restored. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, the son, however, continues to remain prideful, even though he is warned through the interpretation of the dream, and even though he had seen what happened to his father. And he's later assassinated, so he comes to a terrible end. These images that we're seeing in Daniel reflect all the way back to creation. We see this so often in the Old Testament, all the way back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and also Psalm 8, which talks about creation. Humans are created in the royal image of God. We humans are the crowning glory of God's creation. And we are given authority to rule as well, not because we are little gods, but because we're ruling in God's behalf. We're ruling because God has sort of given us the authority for his authority. And by doing that, we are uh, ambassadors or managers of all that God has made for our benefit. And it goes well for us if we understand that he's the owner and we're just the managers. As long as we acknowledge that, things go well. When human kingdoms forget and rebel against God, then they set themselves up as gods and they become less than human. That's kind of this theme all through these stories in the book of Daniel. They become like beasts and they will ultimately face God's just judgment. In the sixth section, which is also paired with the furnace incident, and if you'll go to that YouTube story, you can see how these things fold together. This time, Daniel is the one being persecuted. He remains loyal to God. He is sentenced to death, but God delivers him from the beasts, those lions. Similar to the furnace incident, Daniel is exalted by the king who praises Daniel's God, and he recognizes even though there's a little bit of remorse on his part after he had done what he had to do, he recognizes that Daniel's God is the God, and he wants everybody to bow down and worship that God. So there's this huge conversion again from a human king. Seventh section. Everybody say seventh section. Very good. It's paired with chapter two and more dreams. This is the center of the book where all the themes come together in this wonderfully designed book of Daniel. Daniel has a dream, and this time, it's not the king, it's Daniel who has the dream. And ironically, you think, well, he's the guy who's been given the supernatural ability to discern meanings of dreams. He's gonna be able to interpret his own dreams. Nope, doesn't happen that way. For some reason in these prophecies, it's important that God uses somebody else to help discern what these things mean. And that's going to become very important, as we'll see toward the end of this overview. So God provides a helper, but it's got to be a supernatural helper because there's no human being who can do it. So he provides an angelic messenger to explain this dream that Daniel has. Daniel's dream includes four beasts. The first three include a lion, a bear, and a winged leopard. That's something we don't normally see at the zoo. But there's some symbolism here, and they represent three arrogant kingdoms. Then there's this fourth beast. Now, you've got several of these horns. Every time you hear about the horn of authority or the horn of kingship, the horns were representing like the diadem, things that would be a sign of authority over a king. And so for a person to have a lot of horns would mean they have a lot of authority. But in this case, there's this one huge, gigantic horn, almost like a ram's horn and it would be a super beast. That's representing that he has more authority, more power than any of the other evil kings. So this person is going to set himself up against God and persecute God's people. 
Remember that idea of a super beast in comparison with all these other evil, lesser evil kingdoms. They're still evil, but they're not nearly as evil as that super beast. And then we've got Daniel's dream. The term son of man comes up here, and that becomes an important term for all of us, especially as we start looking ahead into a farther distant event. In this case, son of man can be used in two different ways. It could be used to symbolize God's covenant people, including their kings, those who are under God's authority, and they're in charge of God's people, like David and Solomon, for example. They were sons of men, and they were under God's authority, and they were rulers over God's people. And yet, it can also be talked about in the Son of Man. Now, that's something that's going to point us ahead in time toward the Messiah, which is very important, especially as we think about the Messianic prophecies that start to crop up. And then, here's the biggie. Drum roll, please, everybody. A big event is seen in this dream. God, the Ancient of Days, we've seen some songs that has that phrase in it, sits on the throne. He destroys the super beast, exalts the son of man. This is the son of man who comes on the clouds, which is a representation of being above everyone or coming from heaven and shares in the rule of God's kingdom. That's the big event. And we have to look forward to that as well. So we've got this sort of end of times pointing ahead into a far future event also seen in Daniel. Now, let's summarize the first half of the book because we've gotten there. Chapters 1, 3, and 6 are stories of faithfulness in the face of persecution. And these stories offer hope to God's suffering people, wherever they might be, and in whichever generation we might be living. We also see the reason for their suffering, and this is vital. It's so important. This is something that Israel just could not quite figure out, as we've seen in our studies before from the different minor prophets that we've looked at before, and in uh, Mark's study of the judges, we see that Israel just didn't quite get that the reason for our suffering is that we rebel against God. Human suffering is a result of rebellion against God and his authority over our lives. That's why we have suffering on the earth. Human kingdoms have rebelled against God, and they have, in a sense, become less human or like beasts basing their life on base nature rather than on the divine nature that's imputed to us because we are the crowning glory of God's creation. Chapters two and seven, these are these visions that are connected and these visions encourage patience even when injustice seems to reign on the earth. God's people are to wait patiently for him to bring his kingdom rule over this world and it feels like it's gonna take forever sometimes. Oh, so often we feel like, God, when are you going to bring about some justice? We need some intervention. We've been through a year like that in 2020. That's when he will eventually judge rightly and will vindicate his people who have endured unjust treatment. This is something that, as we're going to see, is something that he was looking forward to in a near future event, a farther future event, and a far distant event that's talking about that ancient of days and getting rid of the, or finally conquering that gigantic beast once and for all time. The final three visions in Daniel shed a little bit of light on the big question that keeps coming up. When is this stuff going to take place? That's what gets people into hot water. Too many people have tried to answer the question when by misapplying the purpose of a book like Daniel. The big question, when? Chapter 8, there's another vision about the last two beasts of chapter 7. This time, they're symbolized by a ram, which, as we can see through the text, represents the Medes and Persians, and then a goat, symbolizing ancient Greece. And then we've got these several horns, one large horn symbolizing an evil king. And as we're going to see when we get into the details, starting next week, we're going to take it chapter by chapter. We're going to start to see why it was important that we understand the near future, farther future, and far distant future events. Because if we start to try to misapply modern and contemporary people and dates with these things, we miss the point. The evil king from chapter seven, Mr. Largehorn, will attack Jerusalem. He's going to set himself up above God in importance and 
He's going to defile the temple with idols. This is that uh, abomination of desolation that's talked about and something that Jesus actually quotes in Matthew. In the end, though, this evil king will be destroyed by God who will exalt his people and his kingdom. Now, who is this evil king? This is something important for us to know. This is introducing a, an important character that we might not know a whole lot about. He becomes very important in the book of Daniel. Antiochus Epiphanes, also known by those who know him well as Antiochus the Mad, was born in 215 BC. Now remember, if we're going towards zero, we're counting down. It's like uh, somebody who tries to roll back their odometer so that they can make their car feel like it's newer than it really is. That's kind of like what we're doing here with these uh, numbers that go on the other side of zero. And so 215, he's born, and then he dies in 164 BC. He was the king of the Hellenistic Syrian kingdom. He encouraged Greek culture and institutions. And if we know a little bit something about the wars of the Maccabees, he suppressed Judaism and continued to escalate the contentious relationships with uh, the Jews. And that eventually led to the wars of the Maccabees. So the big question is when, by chapter nine, Daniel is scratching his head. Even he doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand the meaning of his own dream. And he even poses that question. He's saying, okay, God, I need some help here. What is going to happen? How is this all gonna to come together? When is this gonna take place? Daniel looks at the scroll from Jeremiah and he sees there that the exile of Israel is supposed to last 70 years. Now, from where Daniel is at that moment, he's thinking, oh, okay, that's actually hopeful because that 70 years is going to be up pretty soon. So he's thinking, could it be that we're entering that final period of the 70 years? If so, oh, Lord, I sure hope you'll come. Let's make this thing right. Let's just finish this chapter off and get things moving in the right direction again. And so Daniel asks God to fulfill his promise. He goes, please make it soon. Enter an angel. But, uh-oh, this is not good news. This is not a good news angel. The angel says, um, Israel's sin, the thing that got you into exile in the first place, the rebellion against God, it has continued, and it's continued unabated. Therefore, uh-oh, bum, 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 Israel's exile will continue seven times longer than originally envisioned. I haven't looked into it yet. I couldn't help but think of the seven times hotter because fire was always a representation symbolically of some sort of a trial, a refiner's fire. I, I kind of wonder if maybe there's some symbolism there that's saying seven times hotter means, oh yeah, you're going to be in the refiner's fire even longer than you thought because God still has a lot of refining to do in you. We'll check that out and see if that has some validity. But seven times 70, 490 years. Oh my goodness. But that helps Daniel understand some of the things that they may be looking ahead to. Daniel is very disturbed in the final chapters here, chapters 10 through 12, and he has one final vision. And now I want you to ask out loud, what's the one final vision? Okay, we're going to be looking at that in detail, but let me give you the overview for now. Same series of kingdoms, Persia, Greece with Alexander the Great, lesser kings, leading up to the final king of the north. And this bad king destroys Jerusalem, sets up idols in the temple, that abomination of desolation, and exalts himself. And yet he comes to ruin. So we're seeing almost a restatement of these things, showing that there are three basic events. And that's important for us because speculation abounds around what all these things mean. Many people wonder, could the evil king be Antiochus? Could he be pointing specifically to that? And does everything else have to try to fit that paradigm? Because if so, we have to monkey around with some times and dates and a couple of things that don't quite make sense for it to all center into Antiochus. How about the Roman Empire? There were all those events that were happening as they coalesced with the Roman Empire and then the Jews and some of the clashes that they had. And then Jesus comes on the scene. And then we understand that Jesus is crucified, dies, is buried, rises again, and Jesus had even pointed ahead in time when the temple would be destroyed a second time, this being in 70 AD, not the one that was way back in circa 600 BC. 
And so could it be the Roman Empire? Well, let's try to fudge some of these factors and see if all these dreams could have to do with that. And people say, well, some do, but some don't. Eh, I'm not sure. And then some say, could this all be leading to Jesus' second coming? Could it be pointing straight ahead all the way in time to the Antichrist and then Jesus' second coming? And many people really try to make it fit their paradigm. So we've got the premillennialists, the mid-tribbers, we've got the amillennialists. We got the, I'm okay, whatever it happens, just so it happens, I want to be ready kind of gang. And so the symbols don't all line up. This is the problem. None of the symbols in these dreams and visions line up perfectly with any one of those events and those speculations. And yet, <laughs> what if they're all correct? What if they're pointing to three events which foreshadow one big event in the far future so that we have a near future event, a distant future event, and a far distant future event. Well, guess what? That's what's seen in a lot of the prophetic writings in the Old Testament. When the elders were teaching some of the pastors down in Haiti, we were going through the prophets, and it would be seen so often that this is the pattern. God established the pattern in writing this Old Testament. That's what we see, and it certainly seems to line up very nicely for us in Daniel. So we've got three basic main events. That's all we've got basically in Daniel, but they're just repeated several times. And yet we see these parallelisms that point to each other and to help us understand what they mean because of the symbolism there. So we've got the coming of Antiochus Epiphanes. We've got the first coming of the Messiah. And then we've got the coming of that big horn, the great beast, the Antichrist. And as we see, because of the parallels and the way the book folds together, Antiochus actually is sort of a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. He's not the Antichrist, but he's one that's so similar that if we can understand that the Antichrist is going to be in many ways like Antiochus was, he's like an Antichrist type, just like we've seen that there are Christ types in the Old Testament. And so now we've got an Antichrist type, and Antiochus is one of those Antichrist types. So three main events repeated several times, each prophecy relates to the main three prophecies. So when we have a lot of people who are trying really hard to fit these things into modern contemporary uh, history, they try to say, well, this politician is going to be the Antichrist, or this is the specific date when all this is going to take place. And they've missed the point of prophetic books in the Old Testament. Both times the Messiah enters our world, it will be preceded by a severe season of persecution. We see that. It's pointing out for us something that's a foreshadowing of the greater event to happen in the future. We know that there was a great deal of persecution before Jesus came on the scene the first time, the first advent, the incarnation. And Antiochus Epiphanes was a part of that persecution. In fact, he was a big cause of the persecuted church. The second time, however, that foreshadowing is seen through Antiochus, the Antichrist is going to persecute the church and it is going to be bad. Some people have said that they think some of the government uh, infringements on our rights in America have been a form of persecution. Folks, <laughs> it's nothing. You ain't seen nothing compared to what we know that the church is gonna have to endure when the real persecution comes. The purpose of Daniel, this is where we need to understand the purpose, which helps us learn how not to try to interpret prophetic writings like this. The purpose of Daniel is to offer hope to future generations of all believers everywhere. And it did so during Antiochus's empire. It has continued to do so. It did so all the way through the incarnation when Jesus was developing his disciples, when the new church got to going, they started looking back at these other books Jesus actually even quoted from the book of Daniel, so we can see that it's continued to be used through generations to give us hope because we understand that God is still sovereign. He's still in control of all governments, all nations. He's more powerful than any nation on earth. And one day, one day he's going to confront evil and bring his just justice. And Jesus even uses those images from Daniel to confront oppressive leaders in Jerusalem. So here's some clues from Revelation that we need to talk about. This is something I think is very important. John, who wrote the apocalyptic book, Revelation, picks up on some of the ideas from Daniel. 
And we can see some parallels and some connections with that. John is in exile on Patmos. He's writing with some visions that God gives him. There are a couple of reasons why he may have needed to write that way. For one thing, if he was sending his writings off to other people, they may have thought he had just gone mad because he's writing in this cryptic way, this artistic, poetic way. But it was all about the symbolism. That was what was important in the book of Revelation. And he was probably applying many of these things to the Rome of his day. And I think Mark Elwell had touched on this a while back, and I appreciated what he was bringing to bear from a real religious scholar saying that it looked like many of the things in Revelation may have been pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem. It's a very intriguing thing to look at that. But what we see is that there was the death, burial, and resurrection, and that impacted everything that we see happening, not only in the prophetic books in the Old Testament, but we can see that the New Testament seems to unlock something in these far distant future events. Here's where we get to a key. This is important. Daniel himself did not even know the outcome of his prophecy. Let's look to Revelation and notice the key to unlocking the words that were sealed up for him. Here's God's reply when Daniel starts to say, explain to me, God, what's going on? Go your way, Daniel, for the words written on the scrolls back then are shut up and sealed until the time of the end, a.k.a. the last days. Now, God gave some pretty wild things to Daniel in the way of these visions and dreams, and Daniel passed them on exactly the way he saw them and heard them. And then God said that there would be no more prophecy to Daniel about the future. God wasn't going to explain any of this stuff to Daniel. It's like, Daniel, you're on a need-to-know basis. I've given you what I need you to put down. You've done it. Good for you. You've done your job. But now we're going to seal them up. Isn't that something that Daniel might not have ever had a clue about how important those prophecies were? I suspect that may be the case with a lot of Christians today. We may do things out of obedience to God, and we may never know the outcome this side of heaven. But if we stay true to God's word and obedient to God himself, God's going to reward that person one day. And eventually we'll be able to see the results of our obedience, and we'll probably shake our heads and say, when did I do that? I think Jesus may have said something about that in his Sermon on the Mount. So then... Acts 2.17, I need to bring in a couple of New Testament passages so you can see a connection that's made here as we look between Daniel and Revelation, and we can see something very important about the events centering in on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The surrounding passages related to Peter's sermon at Pentecost show us that the last days began at the time of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and his ascension. These are the last days. As soon as Jesus accomplished the work on the cross, when he said, it is finished, telestai, what was finished? Not just his life on earth. He was finishing everything that God had predicted would happen through the prophets in the Old Testament and which he empowered Jesus to do, even though he wanted the, to get uh, God to let that cup pass from him because he knew it was going to be so tough. And yet he went through it anyway, obediently. So when he said, it is finished, this was a big deal. The Apostle John paints an intriguing picture for us about heaven in those last days. This picture is painted for us in Revelation 5, 1 through 5. Here's a synopsis. The lamb who has been slain is now standing. Where is he standing? Beside the throne. There was something in the right hand of the one sitting on that throne. What was in his right hand? A scroll. Oh, bum, bum, bum. What's unique about this scroll is that it has been sealed. And it hasn't been sealed with just one seal. It has been sealed with seven seals. The number seven in the Bible conveys the meaning of completion and perfection. So this scroll, which has writing on both sides, has been perfectly and completely sealed. Does this sound familiar from the book of Daniel? It could also mean that the message contains contained in that seal is a message of completion and perfection. Both are true. It was sealed perfectly, and the message is perfect. The Apostle John, in telling about this event in heaven, wept because he just knew there was no one worthy to open those seven seals and explain the prophecies contained inside. He was distraught. And then we get to see something really wonderful. Lean in close and listen to this. 
Listen to what the elders say to John. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Who is the lion of Judah? It's Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah is a symbol found in Genesis and Revelation. And in Genesis, Jacob blesses his son, Judah, referring to him and his future tribe as lion's cubs and as a lion. In Revelation, this symbol is seen again when the lion of the tribe of Judah is declared to have triumphed and is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Jesus, therefore, is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. Therefore, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then who is this root of David? Talking about a family tree here. Who is the father of David? Jesse. The root of David then comes down through this family tree. The term, the root of Jesse, figuratively stands for the Messiah. The root of Jesse is a reference to the Messiah found in Isaiah 11.10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Jesse was King David's father. Jesus descended from this lineage in the family tree, so to speak. So the root of the family tree is Jesse. The Hebrew word for the root, sheresh, implies a root that remains alive and sends up a shoot or a branch. Thus, the root of Jesse was a root from which more descendants would come. And we knew that all the way through that line of David, including some of those guys that were taken up into captivity in Babylon, by the way, was going to come the Messiah. So this is a big deal. Listen carefully to this one. It's going to blow your mind. When Jesus conquered the last enemy of sin, which is death, by dying in our place on a cross and by being resurrected from the dead after his crucifixion and burial, he unlocked the scroll. So the death, burial, resurrection, resurrection and ascension of Jesus is the key event or key events. It's the key. That's what unlocks the scroll so we can understand what Daniel is talking about. When he does so, the prophecies of Revela Revelation 6 through 22 are revealed. They both explain in much greater detail these things that Daniel had been asking about, and they add the new farther future prophecies related to Christ's return, his second coming. So we're really blessed now to have this powerful light, this spotlight of the New Testament itself, that we can illuminate on Daniel's Old Testament prophecies. That's why in this study, we're going to use the New Testament and the events of Jesus, because Jesus is the key, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, so that we can really look now at what all this means through Daniel and his revelation to us because of the dreams and visions. Isn't that cool? It just ties up for me everything that we've been talking about for a couple of years now. In fact, I, I mentioned that numerous times when I preached all the way through the book of Matthew, that there are certain things that are threads that they all go together. And just like there's the center of the book of Daniel, and when it's folded together like that, things lock up on either side and they refer to one another. The same thing is happening here, except the center of everything in history is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and everything on either side matches and helps us understand it clearly. Jesus is the key. The key events of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection are found in the New Testament scriptures. Jesus is the key, and in that we can find hope for all generations because we're going to find a pattern and a promise. The pattern is that human become beasts when they exalt themselves, redefine right and wrong, and when they fail to acknowledge God as their true king. That's the pattern. We see that all the way through Israel's history. We definitely see it in the book of Daniel. All these people who try to set themselves up as being more knowledgeable than God. Well, I finally found something that I'm so much smarter than God about. God says, nah, you're not. And he takes them down a notch. The promise is this, one day God will confront the beast. That's an important promise. He has done so on smaller scales throughout history, 
in small ways, but we're looking forward to that time when ultimately he's going to confront the big beast, the gigantic beast, the Antichrist. He's going to rescue his world and his people by bringing his kingdom rule over all the earth. And then true healing justice will be found. We get to look forward to that. That's our hope. And it's based on everything which is abundant in evidence because it was put down for us over a period of time in 1500 years from all these inspired authors, including Daniel, so that we could see the picture. And it comes uh, like three dimensionality rising out of books like Daniel for us so we can see it clearly. The message of hope for all generation motivates faithfulness to God. That's the purpose of this book. We can remain loyal to this God who keeps his promises, knowing that one day Jesus is going to return, and when he does, he's going to bring rule and reign to the earth. So I'm boiling it down to this. Remain ready and remain faithful. That's it. That's the crux of the purpose of Daniel. Remain ready, remain faithful. And we can be faithful because we have that hope of the promise of his coming. Now, I left for you the story of Karen Chapel when she was facing a big decision and she had to go home and pray about it over the weekend and talk with her husband. What do I do? Do I continue to say, I can't sign off on these syringes because they were inappropriately made and they're contaminated? Well, she decided that she was going to do the right thing. She said, it may cost us. It may at very least put all of our plans for your seminary degree and, and our future career goals on hold, it may push them way off into the future, or at the very most, it might derail those plans. I don't know, but we have to do the right thing. If we know anything from our study of scriptures, we know we've got to do the right thing here. And so she did. She went back in and she wouldn't sign off on it. But because she wouldn't sign off on it, it created a delay so that they could not get those syringes to the next place where they were supposed to go is one of their companies that was uh, buying the syringes. Well, the president of that company started an investigation to find out why they were delayed and found out that Karen was the delay. Well, why did she delay it? Because she didn't want to sell them contaminated syringes. He was impressed by that. So you know what that company did? They hired Karen. She lost her job at the other place, but they said, we want somebody like you because that's precisely what you were supposed to do in your job. You've got character. We need people with character, especially in your line of work. God blessed Karen and her husband. Her husband went on to finish his degree and he became a president of a Christian college. God blesses his people if we'll stand firm on his word and obedient to his will. He'll do that for us too. And so Daniel is just as important today as it was back when it was written. Let's pray. Father, it's really encouraging to know that we can remain faithful to you because of the great hope we have that you're going to come and set things right again. I pray that you'll bless this study in Daniel and that you'll continue to speak to our hearts personally, each one of us, so that we can be like Karen, not the one in the memes, but the one who did the right thing by not signing off on contaminated syringes so that we will stand for right because we stand for God, as Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, and as we can see all of God's children throughout history standing for right because they're standing for God. May we stand for you, I pray in Jesus' name.